I have a 65-year-old bladder, so. <laughs> All right, Peter, recovered alcoholic. And uh, prayers and promises for step 11. There's something that goes, if I'm faithful to the practice, I will experience the practice's faithfulness to me. If I practice fidelity to God, I'll experience God's fidelity to me. This walk, uh, the work, I should say, we're doing, Chris talked about eight, nine, Jim talked about four and five, we talked about six and seven. All this work, uh, quite frankly, where we arrive, which our book talks about, the sunlight of the spirit, speaks loudly for that power that cannot be spoken about. There are no words. We, we tell words, we tell stories in AA. But even when we tell our story, it really doesn't touch what we went through. And moreover, when we're talking about God, uh, we can try to paint any kind of picture. You come up with the best adjective to describe God, you can't. But we get an idea. In fact, if I was able to describe God, it's probably not God. And the thing about um, uh, this walk we're on, I'll use things to make me feel godly. Um, I will wrap myself up in bandages. Thomas Merton talks a lot about this. Of we'll call it money, property, and prestige, because I know I'm so hollow and uh, unrecognizable, but if I acquire enough stuff, get enough popularity, you'll recognize me. And somehow the delusional thought is I'll fill this hole in the soul. But eventually those bandages fall off and I realize I'm just an empty vessel. I need to come to terms and peace with that. Um, in the pursuit of that, uh, to get what I think I'm supposed to have, um, I wind up empty all the time. It's the guy who comes to a meeting and, uh, or the woman and they're in incredibly good shape. And they look good, the clothes just fit them well, they got that, that, that healthy glow on them, and they say, oh my God, what are they doing? You know, they eat right, they work out, they just look fabulous. And then you start to sponsor them, and you realize that they can't be any other way because they're driven by vanity. It's not even an organic thing, but I want to get in shape, I feel like I need to do this and enjoy the process. They're driven for vanity or, or by vanity or, or the person that, um, you know, we see come to a meeting, a home group, and they always have money on them and they're working lots and lots of hours or they have two jobs or run a few companies and you say, my God. How did I get so successful? I, I want to be like that. I need to be more productive. And then you start to sponsor them, and greed is driving them because no matter how much money they have, it's never enough. They need the next deal. They need the next million, and they get that. They need the next million, and they're driven by that right to a drink. And the cool thing about being in the world of the spirit, uh, can we experientially talk about that? Now, I, would I think all of us, I can speak for us, are like a big, fat bank account for obvious reasons, but my mind gets involved and says, then I'll achieve happiness. Failing to realize I take me and my stuff just into a higher tax bracket. <laughs> and I remember I had a sponsor who told me, when I get to a place of acceptance, not apathy, but acceptance of having very little and working with that, it's an opportunity that I can, I can achieve more and be grateful for whatever comes down the pike. But if I'm constantly trying to chase and grab the brass ring while I'm scattered in here, no matter what I achieve, it's not good. I'm looking in the wrong direction. What I need to be doing is seeking out God all the time. This interior prayer life where I'm looking for the all of God and everything, the, the practice of uh, 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 getting right with God. I, I don't like to say closer to God because one of the truths I woke up to is third step says uh, keep close and perform his work well. I don't have to get close to be close. It's an awakening of how close God was. There is no proximity between us and God. That is the awakening. The awakening, he's closer than my own breath. And I've been searching but in all the wrong directions.
I've been searching for it in horror. I've been searching for it in the money. I've been searching for the job. And it feels good for a while. Then it gets old. And the journey, the old time has always said, was inside where it always was. When I was living in an abandoned building, I had just as much God in me then as I do right now, whether it's a little or a lot. The other thing I can get into, and it's so subtle how the ego gets in there, it says, well, I need more God. I said earlier, I need a smaller me, not a bigger God. But I need more God. I need to experience more of God. And that sounds good on the front end, but how much of that is ego driving me? If I get more God, I'll be okay. What if God said, this is all I'm giving you of me. Can you work with that? This is all you're going to get. In fact, that job, you're going to have that job till you retire. You're not going to be the CEO. And that mid-range price car that you drive around in that's broken 100,000 miles, that's your car. You're not getting the new Beamer. Because if I give you that, it's going to take you away from me. And if you get away from me, I'm going to have to put you in detox. <laughs> when, when our book talks about uh, this huge, spectacular upheaval, we tend to think, when that happens, I'm going to walk on water, and AA is going to come to me, and I'm going to uh, uh, give them these new insights into their life. Sometimes, you, often, the huge, spectacular upheavals, I'm content with who I am, what's and all. And I show gratitude for God for all of it. I would love to have a lot more money. I would love to have a brand new car. I would love to own my house. I think we can go around the block with people in line with that stuff. I want to be successful. That's all good. But can I be content with where I am? If I don't have a working relationship with God, I will never be content with anything I get. I will be the little Brad who gets toys for Christmas on Sunday. On Monday, he doesn't play with them. He wants a new toy in the store and stomps his feet on come mom and dad won't give it to him. That's what I do. So when I, I, I look at the 11th step, uh, I'm going to throw a story out first and, and then get into this 10 and uh, 11 stuff real quick. Um, oh, let me do this. Step 10. Um, if I was the mayor of AA, I would do something. Um, I would change a few things. Um, forgive my boldness. Um, how many meetings we go to and we hear, okay, we're going to bring up somebody to read how it works. Almost every meeting, a lot of meetings, read how it works. I remember in Brooklyn, they just read step one, two, and three and get to the meeting. I, well, there's nine other steps. What, what was that about? Um, but we read how it works. Rarely have we seen a person thoroughly follow a path. I mean, rarely have we seen a person fail us thoroughly follow a path. And we read it. And we've heard it. Some of us have heard it so many times, we don't even hear it anymore. I mean, we hear it, but it's like background music. And nowadays, we're looking at our phone to make sure we got enough likes while how it works is going on. We're not even here anymore. Beyond that, I always think about, I got a new guy sitting, comes into the meeting. He's got maybe a couple of hours. He's got a couple of days, and it's on him. And he hears, you know, Joe's making 20 years, and Mary's making five years, and this guy's not going to make it till 10 o'clock. He wants to, but it's calling him. He can't get out. And he says, when is this thing going to go away? I've been trying this forever. He says, I can't stay sober. I can't. When is this noise in the head to drink compels me to drink going to go away? And we're reading how it works, which is informative. It does that guy no good that night, or very little good. Okay, so I, this is how it works, but what about right now? I got to get home sober. I, 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 I'm going to fight it. And then tomorrow's another day. I got to fight it again. And then we throw this at him. We throw something that is incredibly powerful. And those of us who've been around can say, this is not just something in the book. It, it's experientially we've had this. It says this. We cease, I'm going to tell this new guy this, that you will cease fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Because if you're like me, when we come here, we're not only trying to fight off the drink, we're fighting with a lot of other people and circumstances. And if only mom was this way, and if only dad was this way, and only if the first wife did this, and only if the second wife did that, and only if the third wife did this, and only if my boss did that, and we're just tied it in a major league baseball, if only, we all have an if only story, and then we hear Joe sharing his if only story, and Mary sharing her if only story. None of that keeps me sober. 
We cease fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. These are our 10-step promises. For by this time, sanity will have returned. And we got to stop right there because back in step two, we're talking about getting to this place and we will arrive at a place of sanity, wholeness of mind, truth, solution, oneness with God. All the same thing for me. And step 10 is telling this new guy, you're going to get to this place where this is going to work different. And it isn't positive affirmation, it isn't self-will, it isn't self-help, it's through the awakening of the soul. The soul, the visual is, here's the soul, it awakens, we get right with it, and it kind of trickles up into you and says, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea. Our book says we react sanely and normally. That's not a conclusion of the mind. I know some cats are saying the first three steps are conclusions of the mind. No, they're not. I have, my mind has one conclusion, me first, you third, and I get drunk. It says, for by this time sanity will have returned. I will seldom be interested in liquor. I'm going to tell this guy, if you're ever tempted, you're going to recoil from it like from a hot flame. I'm going to tell this guy, you're going to react sanely and normally, and you'll find that this is going to happen automatically. I'm going to tell Joe, you don't have to do anything. It's a result of the steps. God's going to do this for in his merciful way. You have to think the drink through, play the tape to the end, keep it green, remember where I come from. It's part of the package. If we tell this guy, you'll see that your new attitude toward liquor has, will be given to you without any thought or effort on your part. If I'm thinking, I'm in trouble. As an alcoholic, I love to think and listen to the narratives. See, that, that, that the reason why the narratives and the thought life are so powerful because they're mine and I believe them to be true. If Mark came up to me and said, hey, I got some thoughts in my head, I would say, Mark, that's crazy, it's delusional, just dump it. But when they're my thoughts, I don't listen to that, they're true. And it gives them power. This is, it just comes, this is the miracle of it. We're not fighting it. Neither are we avoiding temptation. We're going to tell this new person, you're going to feel like you've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. You won't even swear the stuff off. And here's the place called recovered. We're going to tell this guy, this problem will be removed. In fact, it will not exist for you. What a promise. This thing is on me like it was with me. Drink, don't drink, drink, don't drink, drink, don't drink, use, don't use. Oh, my God, it's not only 9 o'clock. They told me to hang in till 12 o'clock. It's a new day. How am I going to get till 12 o'clock? 12 o'clock happens. Now it's 3 in the morning. I'm going out the door. I'm not going out the door. I'm going out the door. I don't know. Tomorrow I'll use it. I'll get drink signals, drink issues, drink this, drink that. Everything's about a drink. And it says it's all going to be removed. You get to a place called recovered. It means free, free of me. And there's space, if you will, between me and this thing called alcoholism. Not only active drinking, but the isms. See, so I have alcoholism, not wasm. I need to get unhooked from all of that. Because even though I'm sober, I'm still, I could still be thinking like a drunk. And every once in a while, that, that voice gets in there. Yeah. I was um, driving to Texas, one, uh, to the airport, and, uh, flying to Texas. And a um, wonderful weekend ahead of me. Uh, I have a lot of friends in Texas, and uh, I was really looking forward to it. And I had been on the road like five weekends in a row. And uh, Marion couldn't make every weekend. It gets really pricey, you know, buying these tickets for when they don't pay for the spouse. And um, so this one I was alone, and I'm driving 95 towards Fort Lauderdale, towards the airport. And uh, it's a gorgeous summer morning, absolutely beautiful. And I start thinking, well, my mind starts giving me thoughts. By the way, I would always think I have thoughts. If I had thoughts, they were my thoughts, I can get rid of them. But the thoughts have me, so I can't get rid of them. What I need is God to get in the middle. So um, I start thinking, like, I'm going to miss another weekend. What are you, like, Mr. Ray Hay now? And I'm leaving Marion behind. This is a perfect beach day. And I'm thinking of beach, go to dinner later, walk on the beach tonight, and I'm going to Texas. Now, Texas was like, I don't want to go. 
And I'm thinking of all this stuff, and I'm like, maybe I should just text them or email, lie, and not go. And then, you know when you're like that, and like God gets in the middle and says, like, Psst, what are you doing? I sent you the tab, send you to Texas, why aren't you going? And then you kind of get, you clear up, and okay, I'm going on my way, you know. When I got to the airport, it was the usual Fort Lauderdale disaster area, cancellations, late flights, and all of that stuff. Very similar to Newark, not the training ground for spiritual growth. And, um, and my flight was delayed, and a lot of flights were just, whatever was going on was a mess. And the lady at the counter is just frantic, trying to get people the tickets and put them on other flights, and they're cursing and hollering, and it comes up to me, and comes out of my mouth, I says, are you okay? And she says, oh my God, I'm so glad it's Friday. I'm out here, these people are crazy. They're going, I, I'm thinking to myself, she's listening to the same guy. I was listening to the car over here. It's the same voice. What I'm able to do when I kind of make that conscious contact with God is unhooked from that. How often do I listen to this voice? How often am I writing a 10 step? And being quick to see where religious people are right. Listen, uh, make, turn to God at once. We ask him to remove this stuff. Turn my thoughts to someone we can help. Make amends if I owe one. All 10-step stuff. How often am I doing that? Or am I letting the stuff just lay, or, lay around and it starts to get like layers on my soul of toxic stuff? And I'm wondering, how come I can't hear anymore? Because I'm not clear. And I, then I start to hide things. And what I hide, I can't heal from. Start to have secrets. That thought life creates my current reality, and it happens that quick. I lose my way. I start to get attachments to many things, thinking that's going to unhook me from all of this, and I don't go to God. You know, we start to, we can accumulate resentments and fears. You know, I I look at those swinging doors back there, and if I was to put a sheet or two of loose leaf in there, um, those doors would open and close, no problem. If I put three or four sheets of paper in there, those doors will probably open and close. But if I put like 20, 30 sheets of paper in those doors, they're stuck. They're jammed up. They're not working properly. I get a resentment or a fear. Oh, no big deal. I'll think it through. I won't think about it, which means I'm thinking about it. And that begets another one and another one and another one. And suddenly I've lost my way and I'm in lockdown. And I have the world on top of me. When I stay that way and that spring gets tight enough, I have a default button to seek relief because I'm an alcoholic. It says vodka. Or Jack Daniels. Or weed. Or whatever my thing is. Because I need relief from life, and I'm not getting it just me running the show. The ego has reemerged, and I can't hear God anymore. So what my 10th uh, step has those promises, then it has some prayers. It's, it's a couple of warnings here. It says, it's easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on my laurels, my accomplishments. We're headed for trouble if we do. Alcohol is a subtle foe. So it says, every day, that one is just convenient for me. Every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will into all my activities. How can I best serve you? Thy will not mine be done. That's a prayer for me. What's God's will? Ask him. God, show me your will today and the power to carry it out. What do, we, we turn in in order to go out. Turn in in order to go out. Turn in in order to go out. If I don't turn in, I'll go without. Conscious contact, constant contact. God, what do I do? Okay, what am I wearing tonight? God, what do you want me to put on? Sport jacket, shirt and tie, what do I do? God, I just had a thought of Joe. I haven't seen Joe in a while. Should I call him, text him? What do you want me to do? I'm trying to lose weight and I'm in Publix, the supermarket. I really want to lose some weight and automatically my cart, my cart goes down the frozen food section with haagen And sometimes God is as simple as go and get some vegetables. And I think God's going to, you know, part the seas, Peter. And sometimes it can be that simple. I need to be listening. And at the beginning, that voice is, is muddled. I don't know it. And then little by slowly, I start to, because it cuts through everything. 
Well, I, whether I like it or not, we, I, are, are called to sanctity. That's the God's path. I don't have to join a monastery to live that way. I can do it in my, my comings and goings. Called to sanctity. We're born to be saints. God's great love is I'm going to give you that kind of life. And you can raise children, have a job, be a blue-collar guy with no education, but you will live saintly with all your faults. That's the way God wants it. What we do in Alcoholics Anonymous, Jimmy's going to talk about this in a few minutes, the 12-step work we get to do is saintly work. I mean, we, we, we kind of do it and we kind of roll with it. We don't even stop and think that if you call uh, uh, the policeman at 2 o'clock in the morning, no, there's nothing against police, and say, hey, there's a drunk next door, they're going to arrest them. And if they call the guy's therapist, they're not answering at 2 o'clock in the morning. And if you call a treatment center, they want to know what your insurance policy is. They're not coming to get you. But saintly work is this. When you call a drunk at 2 o'clock in the morning, they say, I'm on my way and I'm bringing a couple of guys. I don't even know who the guy is, but we're coming. We're going to go get him. And we're going to get this guy out of his own way and put him in, in a safe haven, whether it's a detox or an AA, wherever it is. We're going to hose him down in the shower. We're going to change his clothes. We're going to put him in our car. We're going to get him some food, buy him a cup of coffee, a pack of cigarettes, and we're going to take good care of him. That's saintly work. That's what we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I work with the 11th step. Uh, uh, all, all my teachers uh, um, talked about uh, uh, the disciplines of step 10 and 11. We've entered a world of the spirit experientially. What does that look like? What's that feel like? Can I talk about that? Not tell something I heard that you said, or not say something I heard you said. My personal experience is with this power called God as a direct result of living in 10 and 11 and not wearing uh, an unfinished amends list all over me. How could I hear now if I'm driven by voices of the past? My past is, is, it happened, it's cleaned up as far as I know. I can step into this world of the spirit and start to experience in traveling light. Uh, 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 Chris mentored uh, uh, Chuck Chamberlain. He said something we can always do as good as the light we're standing in. He also said something I thought was profound. I had to pull my car over. He says, our job is not to take care of ourselves." I said, well, that's everything against what I've been taught. He's our job is to seek God and let God's job is to take care of us. And I thought about it since I got into AA and it, it kind of been surrendered to God. My life is awfully good. When I try to take care of myself, it's what I think I need to be okay, which are the very things that might separate me from him and you. So I developed uh, through good teachers, uh, sponsors, a life of prayer and meditation. Uh, we don't have enough time to... Uh, to talk about meditation, what it looks like, how it feels, and the results of. But I can tell you, I'm going to travel a lot lighter because I'm operating out of the soul. I'm not operating out of the mind when I have a meditative life and living a contemplative walk. Yeah? During COVID, I failed miserably. COVID happened, <clears throat> and I took a political side. And I'm glued to the news, my news station which hates the other side. And my sponsor says, does Marion have cauliflower ears by you walking around, you know, just these people, these people, these people, these people. True or not, I was not okay. He's, you gonna get on your white horse and draw the sword and go into the crowd and put something spiritual on Facebook and change the world. It was nonsense. And I had to take a look at that. I have no power over that. My job was to try to practice these principles in all my affairs when other people around me weren't, to take the division of God's will into all my activities in very adverse conditions. They shut the planet down, which was torture, it was punishment. That's a topic for another day. Yet AAs, we, we pretty much survived. We said, oh, really? We invented Zoom. Let's go. <laughs> Remember the first Zoom call? It was unbelievable. Chris talked about it before. I saw a guy step into a shower. I said, this is not good. <laughs> I saw a guy, I remember telling Jimmy about this. 
I'm watching Zoom, and this guy had the phone, and he propped it up on his nightstand. He began to disrobe and he, down to his, his little T-shirt and his tidy whities And he got into bed and pulled the sheets up and laid down his... I said, you wouldn't do that in a meeting. You know? But it kept us, it kept us together. Um, I'm on Zoom, and this woman about 80 years old forgot her camera was on and came out of the shower. I said, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. And then you go on Zoom, and I, Zoom's cool. I mean, you know, I, I still do Zoom. I mean, it held us together. I'm very grateful for it. But if you notice, you see the first page of people. Where are the rest of you folks on page two, three, four, and 5? No one's on. Would you put a paper bag over your head if you're sitting in a meeting? One woman said, I'm going to eat, I'm going to have lunch, I'm hungry, so I won't be on. I'll just listen. You wouldn't do that in a meeting. Anyway. Yeah. So I'm, I'm working with prayer meditation, and um, Mary and I get called to go to uh, Sweden to do a weekend workshop. <clears throat> Marion's never been out of the country. I've been there a couple of times. And uh, we had to fly from um, uh, Miami up to Newark and from Newark across the river, across the ocean. And we get to Newark, and it's, a, it's not a pleasant airport. Um, you know, it's a little rough. I ask a guy, what time is it? He's one of my big Ben and walked away. I mean, you know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> it's late in the day. Um, so anyway, we can't find our gate. Now, Mary and I do a lot of prayer, a lot of meditation. We're Catholics. We work with something called rosary. We're very prayerful life. Thank you, God. So we do a lot of prayer before we head out that morning like we did today. I always pray for the place I'm going to, who's ever attending. I pray for all of that stuff. And we get to Newark, and we can't find our gate. We finally get to our gate, and no one's at the gate itself, and the air conditioner's not working. It's summertime. It's just icky. And then we start to think, we have like about a seven or eight hour flight overnight and get there the next morning. And we're hungry and we can't find a good place to eat. It's airport food. And we're hot and we're tired already. And I look up and Marion's white as a ghost. She comes up and says, honey, I don't know if I want to go. I says, you know what? I don't know if I want to go either. I'm thinking, how do I get out of this? And I'm thinking, my head's telling me, what are you, like Mr. AA? That voice always comes back. You really need to go to Sweden for like two days. You're going to go all the way to Sweden to speak for a total of maybe five hours. Have you lost your mind? No, it's too much in my mind. That's the problem. So we don't know what to do. And I'm thinking text, email, something, cancel, not good stuff in the head. Marion says, let's pray. The power of prayer. We put our stuff down. We're standing off to the side in the terminal at Newark Airport, and we decide to close our eyes and pray. And Marion's leading the prayer. We open up our eyes, and there's a woman standing as far as Frankie is in the first row from us, and she's smiling. Now, if you see someone smiling you at close proximity at the airport, move. <laughs> and she walked over towards us. And she said, it's so wonderful to see people praying in public. That's all we needed. So a conversation started, mostly between her and Marion. And she's talking about, what do you guys do? We said, we're going to an AA event and like that. She says, I have family in al -Anon, and I'm going to go see my dad who lives there. And he's gravely ill, and my husband's there waiting for me. And we had this thing. She knew about al -Anon, She knew about AA. And she was a very, very religious Christian woman. She got the prayer. Somewhere in that conversation, she asked, may I ask what you were praying? And Marion said, the core of what we were praying is something from Scripture. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And she stopped. She said, I can't believe it. She said, I was praying this morning, and when I got up off my knees from praying, I have a bracelet on my nightstand. It's been sitting there forever, and something told me to wear that. And I don't know why till just now. And she took off the bracelet. I have it home on my altar. And what was inscripted inside the bracelet was, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. At that point, I'm like, Rocky Five, let's go to Sweden. <laughs> 
it gets better. We start to get on a plane. She tells us her seat. We say, this is where we're sitting. She, we see her get on the plane. We get on the plane. The plane takes off. I fall asleep because you can't walk around till the bells go off and all that other jazz. I fall asleep. And I have this dream. I said, man, I had the weirdest dream. Like God says, I'm going to send you an angel. I said, I don't know what that's about. It was a weird dream, very real. So anyway, the plane's up in the air and people are starting to move about. Marion said, I'm going to go find Jeanette. That was her name. And she goes to her seat. She comes back. She's not there. Somebody else is sitting there. And maybe we took the wrong seat now, but let's look around. Now, Marion's alcoholic, which means she's looking at overhead compartments. <laughs> up and down the plane. Up. This woman is nowhere. So we do like the eight hours, whatever it is, to Sweden. We deplane. One of the first people getting off. We looked at who was getting off the plane. Now we're stalking mode. And we're watching people get off the plane. This woman, we couldn't find her on the plane. As far as we know, she never got off the plane. I call my sponsor about this. And he says exactly what I was thinking. It could have been you just missed her. She was sitting in the back. Maybe she went to the ladies' room or whatever. Anything could have happened. And you may have missed her on the deplaning process. He's, or, and he gave me the spiritual answer. You think God doesn't have the ability to send an angel to touch you to go do work he hired you to do. See, if I can't say that's possible, then I have a really small God and a very big me. Our book says the age of miracles is still with us. Our own recovery proves that. And when a miracle happens, I use logic to discount it the same way an atheist would. Yet, I'm in AA talking about the miracles of God. I'm so quick to believe sickness in bad times, but I'm skeptical to believe healing in good times. I got it all backwards. And God said, I'm going to show you how powerful and present I am here. God in Scripture says, gives us an equal measure of faith. Yeah? An equal measure of faith. No one gets more than the other. And I'm supposed to use it soberly, it says. Not as a weapon against someone or not like hide it in a closet. I don't have anything. Use it soberly. And what I do with it is really up to me. I need to cultivate that faith. Which means I'm going to offer it to people who have lost their way. I'm going to hang with people who are godly people. I'm not going to hide God in the closet. When a newcomer is talking to me how bad it is for them, I'm going to tell them we're going to get you to God. I'm not going to stop doing that. And I'm going to hang around people who are believers. Not only in AA, but AA is a direct path to God. This thing speaks loudly for the power we can't uh, be spoken about. So I'm, I, I want to give Jimmy some time here. Forgive me for not going through all the promise in the 11th step, but let me just close with this. In doing, I succeed. The book doesn't say do it perfect. But if I go to the gym and uh, I just started CrossFit with my wife, I, I'm a disaster area in that. I did a workout. He says, wow, that was pretty good. She says, that's just a warm-up. Why am I doing this? There's guys in there who were shredded. They look like they're carved out of stone. And I'm coming there with this. I'm going, I'm going home. I don't know what I'm doing. But in doing, I succeed. I'm doing something. Same thing with prayer and meditation. I'm not just going to flub it and say, okay, God, I'm checking in. Have a great day. I'm out. I'm going to do my best to strike up a conversation that has already existed and do my best to sit in a meditation. I don't know what I'm doing. God loves that. In doing, I succeed. I've begun. I've done something rather than nothing. And so I chop wood and carry water day in and day out. I do it for fun and for free. I can't see a life without it. So God gives me, I speak for myself, God has laid a cross on my back. I can complain about it, but I carry it joyfully because he's put it there. Keeps me close to the ground, remember who's in charge, and I need his help. I need his help for endurance, I need his help for, for passion, I need his help for gratitude. But I carry that joyfully. 
He didn't say, pick up another one and put it on your back. That self will run riot. And I played a martyr role. So whatever it is, I do it for God's glory. I get to do it in Alcoholics Anonymous. What we get to experience in 10, 11, and we pass, pass on in 12, is way beyond this book. My sponsor says, if you study the menu in a restaurant and don't order, you go home hungry. You can't eat the menu. This is a the menu. The book doesn't keep me sober. My sponsor, my sponsees, my home group doesn't keep me sober. They're all avenues, part of the mix that God could and would if he was sought. Here's the promise. God can and has because I keep seeking him out. Thank you so much for having me. That's all I got. Thanks.